Right, we've got some people waiting in the lobby. Mm. Are we ready to start admitting people? Yeah, I think it's so. It's worth just noting as well that this is being recorded as well. They should get a pop-up. Yeah. Kelly, I can keep admitting people. Um, then Thank you. when you guys are presenting, I'll keep an eye on that. Thanks so much. Oh, I see. Okay. Welcome everyone. We'll, ju we'll just give it a moment or two before we um, get started with the meeting. But um, yes, if you can keep yourselves on mute, mute as you join and uh, we'll give it a minute or two and let some others join before we start. All right, should we get started? Um, I can see we've got about 13 people or so on the call. So um, welcome everyone to um, this is our uh, paediatric sort of updates and webinar. Um, talking about the Healthier Together programme, the um, Acute Wheeze um, Pathway in Primary Care and also an update on the Children's Hospital at Home programme. Um, my name's Ed Capo Bianco. For those who don't know me, I'm one of the GPs in the ICB. And um, we're recording this session, so um, if colleagues have not been able to join or join partway through, we'll be able to catch up with that. So um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Kaylee first, I think. Kaylee. Hi, everyone. I'm Kaylee Simmons, and I'm the Healthier Together Project Manager for Oxfordshire, um, based at Oxford University Hospitals Foundation Trust. Zoe, do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry, um, I'm Zoe Rooney. I'm one of the general paediatric consultants at the John Redcliffe and lead for ambulatory care. And I've been involved in setting up the hospital at home service and um, adapting the Healthier Together site for Oxfordshire. Thanks, Roy. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Roy Osgood. I'm one of the paediatric consultants, mainly based at the Horton. Um, I've been involved with um, the WEEZ pathway within the hospital home service, as well as content review for Healthier Together. Christina. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Christina Newbold. I'm the matron for the children's uh, hospital at home service and acute pathways within the children's community nursing team. And Usman. Hi, um, good afternoon. So my name is Usman Khaled, one of the pediatric consultants in the Horton. So I'm also involved with the content review for the Healthier Together website. Thank you. I think we've covered everyone, but please shout if anyone else has joined and I can't see. OK, so I'm just going to stop sharing as I really want to um, share the Healthier Together website with you in just a moment. So hopefully some of you will already be familiar with Healthier Together as a new resource for Oxfordshire. Um, we've sent out some comms in the GP bulletin last month and also attended the um, Clinical Directors Committee meeting in September to give a bit of an overview of the project. 
Um, so just to recap slightly, the Healthier Together initiative was established in Wessex and has been adapted across the country in several locations. And we've been commissioned by the ICB to roll this out for Oxfordshire. So the Healthier Together offering is a website for parents, young people and professionals, as well as a parent facing app. The aim is for parents to feel confident in knowing whether and when to seek advice from an appropriate healthcare provider and also to provide clear and consistent online information on child health. Our Oxfordshire website went live on the 9th of October and we've prioritised the parent facing pages at the moment on common childhood winter illnesses for the launch and we've since uploaded some additional pages on more common childhood illnesses so that parents can be easily signposted to helpful information when their child is unwell. So we're now trying to promote the site as widely as possible and get as much feedback as, pos as possible to understand which pages to prioritise next. So if I can just reshare my screen and I'd like to show you the site so far. Hopefully that's coming through okay. Um, so this is our Oxfordshire Healthier Together website. So this is the home page and um, we've got some information here on what parents might be worried about um, and popular topics which we will keep up to date as we get data back from the site around which pages parents um, and carers are accessing most frequently. We've also got some links here to our local services page, which I will show you shortly. Um, and also what's new on Healthier Together page as we're updating the site um, as we move forward, trying to keep everybody updated on what is new on the site. I'll show you that shortly as well. Um, so this is the parent facing uh, area. So we've got some pages relevant to babies younger than three months. And we've got some pages which are relevant to children over three months. Um, so if I show you a page as an example, we'll go for bronchiolitis and RSV. Um, so all of the acute illness pages start with some information on the condition, um, try to make it really easy to read, um, quite short, um, with short videos as well, um, eye-catching colours to kind of draw attention to different areas. Um, and the Healthier Together videos that have been developed for different conditions, some of them have been translated into other languages as well. So we've got some links here to videos in other languages that um, you can click on. So it then takes you into the traffic light guidance for the condition. So we've got your red flags, um, which direct to A&E or 999. Then we go on to the amber flags, which direct to GP or 111. And then green flags, which direct to self-care. It then moves on to what parents and carers should do when their child is unwell with this condition, um, with some helpful links as well. How long to expect symptoms to last, um, just to give an idea of what to expect. Um, and then all of our parent facing pages have this where to seek help, um, general information at the bottom of the page. So it just gives some information on what different healthcare providers can do and how they can help. Um, just for an example. Okay, and then there's a survey as well, um, just so we can see kind of later down the line what the outcomes of parents looking at this page will be. Um, and also we can print it in a PDF. Um, so just to draw your attention to a couple of the tools on the site as well, we've got our accessibility tools down here. So we can trans, um, translate the site into different languages. Um, can increase the text size or decrease the text size and change the contrast as well. So just some handy accessibility tools that also. We've also got a page on should my child go to school or nursery today? Um, and we've put this under the parent carer tab, but also under the professionals um, tab as well, just in case 
queries come through about whether children can go to school or nursery. So um, we've got all of the conditions here. So it just gives a short amount of information on whether children can go to school or nursery. And it's all been taken from the Public Health England guidelines. So moving on then to the professional section. Um, so for example, this is something we will be building up. Um, we'd really like to get some safety netting parent information sheets on here as well for professionals to give to parents um, after contact. Um, but this is what we have so far. So we've got our paediatric primary care pathways. Um, so, for example, the new acute wheeze pathway that we'll be talking about later on. Um, uh, a space for education, training and useful resources, um, some safeguarding information and also a page on our hospital at home service, which again, we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, so just going back to the home page, I just wanted to also show the local services page. Um, so we've got a huge amount of local services in Oxfordshire to support child health and wellbeing um, and family health and wellbeing. So it's a long list, um, but you can filter it down. So either by searching for a keyword, um, the person searching or by a service use. So, for example, if I filter down to special educational needs and disability, this will bring up all of the links. And then this will direct once you click on it, it will just direct you to that um, local service website. You can also just the last thing I wanted to show on the site is the SMS share. So if you want to share a specific page with someone, um, you can click on SMS share. This doesn't cost you anything. We've got um, credits built into the website um, far more than we'll ever use, I think. Um, and just enter the mobile number and share and then that will send an SMS message through to the recipient's um, phone with a link to the page that you're sharing. So you can either just share from the home page or share a specific page as well. We're also promoting the Healthier Together app alongside the web page, um, website. So we've got a banner here just to direct parents to also download the app. We've got a um, page dedicated to the mobile app with some QR codes and some information about what the app is for for parents and that's held in two different places in the website and we're also promoting the app um, alongside all of our promotional materials so posters and business cards um, and on social media to parents as well just to direct them towards the app also. If I just stop sharing for a moment. Reshare the presentation. So I just wanted to talk a little, about, little bit about the app and how it works. So the app is complementary to the website. Um, it is. It was developed in Wessex as well, and it's more nationally uh, relevant. So it doesn't have those um, kind of local services or, or local links. So it has a range of conditions um, based from 0 to 18, and it will pick up any relevant conditions um, based on the child's age of the profile that's created. So anyone can uh, have a look and download the app if you just search for Healthier Together in uh, the App Store or Google Play. Um, so just to share the flow of how the app works for parents. Um, so parents will download the app and then they will create a profile for their child. Uh, this is the information that they need to input to create a profile. They will then select the relevant condition based on what their child is unwell with. First of all, it will give some information on that condition, um, kind of what to expect, um, what to do. And then parents have got the option to undertake a self-assessment triage of symptoms. Um, so if they choose to go through the self-assessment route, then it will present first any red flag symptoms 
Um, if the parent selects yes, their child has got red flag symptoms, it will direct them to call 999, which they can do through the app. It will just then direct them through to their um, phone function on their phone um, or find their nearest A&E and it will pick that up based on their current location if they've got location services turned on. Um, if there are no red flags, it will move, <coughs> excuse me, move forward to the amber flags. Um, and if the parent selects yes, their child has got amber flags, it will direct them to call their GP if it's in their GP practice hours, which um, the app will pick up from the GP practice that they've selected when they've created the profile. Um, or it will direct to 111 or 111 online if the child is over five, um, if it's out of hours. Um, if the child has no amber flags and is green um, symptoms, then it will advise self-care advice or find your nearest pharmacy, again, based on location services. Um, an added functionality of the app. So this is only available to send an online consultation request to your GP practice if your GP practice is onboarded with the Healthier Together app. So the app is fully functional without this, but this is just something that may encourage parents to um, want to use the app because they've got the option to, um, if their child has amber rated symptoms, to send through an online consultation request. Um, so if the practice is onboarded and they choose this function, it will then send through um, the child's details and the symptoms that the parent has selected from the amber list that the child has to the GP practice. So I'll go through that a little more shortly. Um, so here's just some feedback that has been gained from other areas which have onboarded with the app. Give a moment to reach through. And then this is just some information um, which will be shared on how your practice could sign up if you want to onboard with the Healthier Together app to give that option to parents and how to promote it. Sharing for a moment. Um, so just to give you a little bit of data around the app as well. Um, so it has been rolled out in other areas across the country. What they have found is that around um, for those undertaking a self triage assessment of their child symptoms, not not all um, parents choose to do that. Um, but for those that did, around 70% were actually guided to self-care. Um, around 23% flagged up as amber. And of those 23%, 14% then chose the online consultation option. Um, and then 6% flagged as red. So um, what they found is only around 3% overall of parents who chose to undertake the self-triage assessment actually went through to the online consultation request and that equated to about one or two consult requests per day. Um, they've also audited the requests coming through and it was found that they were appropriate um, as well. Okay, so just to, um, we will share the links on if you're interested in onboarding with the app. Also, the app developers, Sinigma, um, will, unfortunately, they couldn't make it today, but they are available to have a chat through in further detail. If anybody would like to know more about how that could um, possibly fit into current processes in practice, um, how to promote to parents, um, but it's really uh the idea is it's likely to then encourage parents to use the app as that one first stop um, to assess their child's symptoms and hopefully with the majority of them being reassured enough to no longer need a consultation. So I think that brings us to the end of Healthier Together. So could I just open it up to any questions at this point? Sarah. Hiya, it was just to say the um, bit about being able to send a 
text message to parents with a link. I assume that will work out cheaper than us just sending it through AccuRx like we might do normally. Is this all to do with reducing fragments and that kind of thing? Do you mean from the website? Really? Yeah, sending it from the web. Share. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure on the costings for QRX or anything like that, but yeah, it won't cost you anything to do that through the okay. website. Okay, <laughs> yeah, because I think we may be start to be charged for sending it through QRX. Uh, right, Is it, okay. Do we need to like have signed up to it or anything to start sending it through the website? No. Or if I just go on it today, would I be able to do that? Yeah, you can do that. I suppose the the drawback is you can only do one at a time, whereas I'm assuming through a QRX you can do a, a batch. Yeah, but if I was, it's more at the moment we've been using it, you know, if you're in a consultation and safety net yeah. and we've set, we've actually set up a little text message already that we're sending patients. So in a sense, we're doing that already. But I was wondering what the advantage is of doing it through the website. And I assume it's to do with the ICB trying to keep costs down. Okay. Yeah, so it won't cost you anything um to do that you just can't add a message it just comes up um i tried it out earlier and it just says um it just says i thought this web page would be of interest and then it has a link that you can click on okay, okay. that's helpful thank you thank you okay, any other questions before we move on to wheeze can I ask a question, Katie? Um, do you, from a GP practice perspective, if you're signed up to this app and you know you get a consultation coming through, do you, have, do you know how that looks? Um, so, yeah, so it needs to come through to an NHS.net mailbox. Um, okay. It unfortunately doesn't um, integrate with the e-consult platform, so it would need to go through to an NHS.net mailbox that would be um monitors throughout the day right so we'd need to have allocated to that our specific you know our generic e email box that yeah. we might get a one on one things through and other things like that yeah yeah exactly okay thank you i think shamin's got his hand up shamin well oh, hi kelly i'm not sure if you met before but uh, i'm the medical director for um oxford health and i um, obviously the community services here, but um, I just wondered in, uh, in the GP out of hours, how does it work in the out of hours period? Um, for the app? Yeah, does it, you know, they, they, do they go through to one-on-one -on -one, those? Yeah, so if it's out of hours and the child has amber rated symptoms, the parent will be advised to call one-on-one -on -one or use one-on-one -on -one online if the child's over five. Yeah, and it picks up um, it picks up the out of hours from the GP practice opening times as well. Fine, and so that, that will just come through the normal 111 process to us. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. But the out of hours service can still use this and as a promotion and um, for leaflets and things like that. You know, it'd be you know, be good for the clinicians, Shamin, to be sharing, yeah. you know, this when you're in contact with parents and things as, you know, what to look out for? Yeah, and um, it was obviously slightly different, but in terms of the text messaging, it's not so, we don't have Actrix in in out of hours, and it's one of those things we're trying to work out um, how you know because text messaging patients in the out of hours would be quite helpful. I know it's not slightly separate to this because it's the other way around, but um, um, but that's something that we're looking at as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Hey, if there aren't any more questions on Healthier Together, we can move on to the new Wheeze pathway. Roy, did I see you've got control or no? Oh, yeah. There we go. Hopefully you're going to be able to. Hopefully. Will it let you navigate through? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, let's see. Am I able to move forward? Yes. Great. Um, so just to reintroduce myself, I'm Roy Osgood. I'm one of the paediatric consultants, mainly based at the Horton General Hospital. Um, I'm just going to be taking the next 10 minutes just to talk through um, our acute wheeze um, assessment tool um, and guidance, which has just been approved through the um, ICB uh, government uh, governance process. It has been a pathway that's been long in the making and will be our sort of 
third acute pathway for hospital at home, um, joining uh, bronchiolitis and uh, gastroenteritis. So I guess really the sort of background is just to talk about the guideline to signpost it and where to find it. Um, and I know Christina will follow on in terms of how it will work in sort of practice and a little bit more about the hospital at home service. So I guess the question is, why do we need a wheeze pathway? Well, I guess probably you see it a lot in your practice is that respiratory presentations are by far, particularly this time of year, one of the biggest reasons for um, seeking medical review or advice in children. And we know the vast majority of children, uh, particularly those under five, will have an episode of wheeze at some point, whether or not this is sort of viral induced wheeze multi-trigger or some of the later ones that develop more of an atopic sort of asthma history. Um, it is one of the biggest um, causes of referral at this time of year and also attendance at ED in general practice. So really the reason for having a pathway was to really give an assessment tool to help identify the severity. Um, also give um, some recommendations on treatment and referral um, pathways. And I guess really the sort of main thing to say with WEEZ is it's very easy when they're very well and in the green and what to do. It's very easy when they're sort of flagging red and what to do. It's these intermediate ones that sort of are, are seem OK, but are probably going to need a little bit more or sort of follow up and may sort of require multiple presentations or review in GP or consideration of referral to hospital. So just to give a background is this is how how it originally looks and, and Katie's already showed you that it um, looks slightly different on the healthier together um, web pages um, but essentially it's two sides one to help um, identify the severity based on age and some of the vital signs um, to identify sort of key actions to take and a few sort of aid memoirs in terms of um, use of things like steroids alternate diagnoses um, and some things about longer management so just to say in terms of the creation of this uh, um, pathway is it's been um, created in consultation with um, both paediatricians, our respiratory team here in OUH, um, discussion with our CCN colleagues um, in OUH and also through C the ICB including the um, medications approver, um, I don't know the full name Ed, sorry. Um, so I guess really um, what I want to highlight is sort of the main point and this amber category which are the ones that where hopefully we might be able to suggest some um, ways of sort of managing either in general practice or with um, CCM referral. So as, as I said the severity is based on your usual things that you would see in most sort of assessment um, uh, traffic light systems and we've broken this down into um, sort of the behaviour side, the vital signs and peak flow if you're able to do it and very rarely you can get a peak flow on a child who's sort of under the age of seven. Generally speaking, the mild, the green are fairly straightforward um, in terms of their um, observations and how they look. Um, the amber ones are these intermediate ones which might have sort of a slight raised respiratory rate, um, some wheeze but otherwise sort of normal saturations and a reasonable peak flow. And this is when you assess them before treatment. And I think sort of the severe ones, again, are often easy to um, to identify. And these are the ones that will be sort of referred immediately in. And these are the ones that have significant signs of respiratory distress, poor air entry or significant reduced um, saturations or peak flow. The tall also has a guide or an aid memoir about sort of what you would expect as the typical um, values for respiratory rate and heart rate um, uh, depending on age. And then some recommended act actions. So um, again, I think probably the green ones are, are sort of fairly self-explanatory in terms of these are the ones that you, you're likely to start salbutamol um, via a spacer and discharge with safety netting advice. And as we said, we've, we've released the uh, parent facing um, uh, web pages on Healthier Together for both asthma attack and for um, viral induced wheeze, which has also some videos on how to use um, spacers and salbutamol. So it's a really useful tool to use alongside this. 
If there's sort of a first wheeze or if there's been significant sort of concerns about their history in the past, but you feel that they have look wise look well, these may be ones that you might be appropriate for discussion with CCNs for sort of further review, sort of not non urgently in the community. Um, but generally, the large majority of these will be sort of managed without sort of significant follow up and adequate safety netting. The amber ones are the slightly difficult ones in that actually probably the vast majority that we see actually if you give salbutamol in practice and review them they will either have a good response in which case actually you might be able to decide on either in previous practice a follow-up in general practice later that day or a phone call um, or if they've not had any response or your worst worried about deterioration might be dis uh, discussed with uh, secondary care. What we're suggesting with the AMBER patients is if actually with salbutamol they, there's been a reasonable response that actually this is where CCN referral and the use of the hospital at home service might be useful just to um, sort of take pressure off from a general practice point of view for further review same day or um, the need for referral to secondary care and Christina will talk through sort of the the how that sort of works within the CCN and the escalation for that including a case presentation from earlier this week for somebody who was referred with WEEZ from general practice who who I believe avoided any escalation to secondary care I believe um, nods. And then I think with the red ones, again, these are kind of the ones that are going to be referred acutely to, to paediatrics and, and are ones that we've recommended initiation of treatment within general practice whilst awaiting for either transfer to hospital. Usually these are the ones that are significantly unwell or needing oxygen and therefore will need ambulance transfer. Um, but again, um, a tool just to identify severity and some suggested actions. It also has some advice about oral steroids. Um, generally speaking, um, not all sort of viral induced weeds need steroids, but you might consider them if they've had sort of multi-trigger or sort of lots of recurrent episodes of weeds or if they're a known asthmatic. It has recommendations for both um, prednisolone or if oral prednisolone isn't tolerated, then we do use dexamethasone. And again, a recommended dose for the younger ones of dexamethasone is on the guideline. So um, it was just to highlight and this um, will be sort of covered in a little bit more detail is this has been um, co-produced with with um, Christina's team in terms of OU, uh, Oxford Health and our hospital at home service. So there is a clear sort of triaging and escalation of patients who will be on a WEEZ pathway as well as when to trigger and escalate to paediatrics. Now, initially, what we're saying is because of um, the need for review sort of later on in the day is prag pragmatically sort of referrals in the morning for review in the afternoon. Sort of later towards the day, these are the ones that are likely going to be needed to either sort of safety netted or discuss with um, paediatrics. Those that are on a WEEZ pathway referred from both hospital care and primary care. Um, if they need escalation back to sort of medical review, this will be done by the CCMs at around 6 or 8 p.m. through paediatric um, on call team. Um, so that's why we're sort of encouraging those referrals slightly earlier in the day to allow sort of assessment um, CCM review. Again, I've just highlighted um, that there are our uh, parent facing um, pages for asthma attack and viral induced wheeze already on Healthier Together. Um, and as Kaylee's already demonstrated, they have the safety netting as to what to do with some advice regarding the use of salbutamol, um, as well as some videos and demonstrations on the correct inhaler technique. And there's also further information about asthma um, plans as well on there. So I will pause there if there's any questions um, that I can hopefully answer. If not, I will ask some of my colleagues to jump in. In which case I will hand over to Christina. I think you're next, aren't you, Christina, to talk about hospital at home and give a real world example of this pathway as well. Yeah, um, I am. Thanks, Roy. I don't have control. 
of any area of my life. So Kaylee, if you can help me with the slides, that would be good. So yeah, hi everybody again. Um, I'm Christina, I'm the matron for the um, hospital at home side of the children's community nursing team, which is in um, Oxford Health. Um, so I just thought it would be a, a good opportunity to give a bit of an update on our hospital at home service first, and then sort of have a look at WEEZ as well. Um, so the pilot for the hospital at home service started in September 2021 and since then we've progressed to introduce a daily virtual ward round with our um, acute paediatric team who are based in OUH and all of our patients are on uh, that have been that have come to us from the acute setting are on the virtual bed board um, and we record all of the information for our children on directly onto EPR as well and we anticipate that with the wheeze pathway we will be putting all of the wheeze patients onto the bed board just so that we all have oversight um, and then when we discharge them we'll we'll inform the GP if, if they've been referred from the GP that that they have then been discharged back. Um, so we now have a dedicated team of hospital at home nurses who cover the shifts. Our service is open from eight in the morning until eight in the evening. And we have an early and a late shift and two people on each one. And we still do have um, cover of those shifts supported by the um, community children's nurses as well as our dedicated hospital at home team because we're all part of the same service. Um, <clears throat> we have capacity for around 12 patients a day. We do have flex with that because as I said we're part of a wider service and actually over the last month we've really regularly had 16 patients on the bed board on any one day. Uh, we have pathways in place for bronchiolitis, gastroenteritis um, and wheeze as well. And we also take patients who are having IV antibiotics, uh, wound care and non-pathway referrals as well. And the non-pathway referrals really need to have very specific escalations around them so that we can um, look after them safely. We do take direct GP referrals and we regularly review incidents coming from the, that have come from the hospital at home side of our service. And actually, I think our regular review of those incidents has, has actually really helped to decrease the incidents. We've sort of really worked on the learning around those, which has been great as well. Um, we have honorary contracts with OUH, so we are able to go in and support in the hospital if, if and when we need to. And a good example of that was when we had the thunderstorm asthma episode earlier in the year and um, we were able to take 11 patients from um, ED on, on the day that the, the system was quite overwhelmed with respiratory patients and we sent one of our hospital at home nurses into ED to support patients who could be discharged and that worked really well. Um, our nursing team are being upskilled with the enhanced paediatric nursing skills course that's delivered via Bradford, Bradford University um, and we're looking at porting that course through Oxford um, and that's been really helpful for us to be able to develop our skills in auscultation and you know just being able to give a really thorough clinical overview and examination of the patient as well. OK, Kaylee, I'm ready. So I just wanted to share some data <clears throat> from the six month period from September 2021 when we um, started the pilot for hospital at home and then more recent data from December last year to May this year. So you can see that our referrals have um, have really increased, which is great. We've got um, an average of uh, 144 appointments per month, which has increased. Our length of stay has gone down a bit, which I think demonstrates the confidence that we have gained as as a, a workforce in terms of be confidently being able to discharge patients earlier rather than holding on to them right until you know, we, we're absolutely confident that they're going to progress well. 
Um, and you can see our bed day saved and um, admission avoidance has increased as we would expect. And what's really interesting to see is that, you know, initially the majority of our referrals came from the inpatient setting and were step downs from, from the ward and from CDU, um, followed by, you know, sort of a quarter of the referrals coming from ED. And now, um, up until May of this year, 47% of our referrals were coming from ED, so they'd really increased. I would guess if we looked at it again now, it's increased even more with ED. What hasn't really changed is the amount of direct GP referrals that we um, that we accept and that, and that actually patients that get referred to us, whether we accept them or we don't. Um, so, so that hasn't, that sort of stayed at the same level. So it would be really nice to see that um, increase as, as we go into the winter. OK, I'm ready, Kayleigh, thank you. Um, and it's just some data on, on you know, bed day saved and um, admission avoidance. Um, and we are part of a national group um, of paediatricians and paediatric nurses who are looking at benchmarking the data that's being collated, because a lot of our data is sort of off the back of what the adult hospital at home services are collecting and actually the children's hospital at home picture looks really quite different so we're, we're working to sort of align that okay so i just thought that i would share um a sort of a case study of a wheeze pathway patient that we had earlier this week so it's nice and fresh um we had on the 6th of november gp called through to the acute pediatric team in the hospital for advice on a 12 year old boy who had an acute exasperation of his asthma he was known to the respiratory team and having regular follow-up so he had had um you know a less than 24 hour history of uh, cough and had woken up that morning struggling to breathe with a tight chest and he'd had 10 puffs of salbutamol at 8.20 and then at 10 past nine and was reviewed by the GP at 9.50 which is when they discussed with the pedi paediatric team. So the plan was to start prednisolone for three days, to have 10 puffs of salbutamol at about 10 past 11, and to refer to our hospital at home team to plan to see him after the um, 11 o'clock inhaler at two in the afternoon and safety netting advice was given then. Okay. So um, we contacted the family uh, who had um, we went over on the over the phone with the dad how he was doing at that time um, and they noted that, that he'd last had his inhaler at 11. His breathing was much improved from the morning. Um, we asked the dad to give the inhaler at quarter to three and that we would visit the home at 5.30 that afternoon to assess him again and the family were happy with that plan and they were also given the safety netting advice at that point. OK, Kaylee. <clears throat> so um, I won't go through every single point, but I just wanted to highlight to you that during the home visit, this is the, the level of assessment that we're able to carry out, which then obviously gives a really good um, clinical overview that we can then share with the acute paediatric team in the hospital and come up with a plan. And so um, you know, the the assessment went well and they were advised to give the inhaler uh, just before they went to bed and then PRN overnight. Safety netting again was given and um, the patient was planning to go to school on the following day, continuing with his oral prednis alone. So the following morning, we um, contacted the family again. We were uh, confident that this, this patient was doing much better and he went back into school, taking his inhaler before school um, and was doing well. So then we um, were able to discharge him from the service, ensuring that he had follow up coming with the respiratory team and that they were aware of the episode that he'd had. And we then informed the GP that he'd been discharged from our service. So just to share some service user feedback 
with you, it's really quite difficult to measure um, reattendance and have we impacted reattendance at all in our service. So if you um, look at the pie chart at the bottom, which has got the more colourful one, you know, if the hospital at home service did not exist, where would you have sought alternative medical assistance? And you can see that nearly half of the families would have gone back to A&E with the rest going to either the GP or 111 out of hours. So that's really quite significant for us in terms of the value that we are adding by going into the home and doing home visits. Um, also, when you look at the top, did the hospital at home service help to provide reassurance and an increased understanding of how to manage your child's illness safely? Um, that that's really significant as well, because we're able to sort of educate the families while we're there in the home with them uh, in order to kind of set them up for the night to understand when they should escalate the children into, um, you know, for a medical review and when they don't actually need to. OK. So just a reminder of where you find the referral to our service on EMIS. Um, so if you scroll down to the documents and then create a letter um, and then you will get a pop up and you would put in CCN and then it will come up as a referral to CCN community nursing team, which you would then email over to our service. And this is what the referral form looks like. Um, it, it's good, at, especially at the moment, to um, call to give us a ring as well, and I'll put the phone numbers on the end of my presentation, um, to ring through the referral to our service to make sure that we can accept it. As I said, we've got a capacity for 12. You know, we are we are um, going constantly going over that, and because we know that these wheeze patients will need a visit and need and often need a time sensitive visit it's good to um, have that phone call just so that we we've got the awareness of the referral coming through. This is just what the referral form looks like. So there is our number for our spa. And as I said, we are available from eight in the morning till eight at night, seven days a week. Um, and our advice to families, you know, on our on our patient leaflets and when we see them, lots of people ask us what is the escalation out of hours for the children that we um, have on our bed board. And all of the children that we see do have their referrals sent through to out of hours so that if they do phone through to 111, we can um, 111 can see that they're under our care. But on the whole, the, the out of hours support for them is either 111, 999 or to go back into ED. Thank you. I've seen some questions coming in, but I haven't actually had a chance to read them while I was talking. And um, Christina, I've tried to answer some of them, but there may be some that you'll um, yeah. be able to help with. So there's... um. There was a question about um, areas of coverage for the CCN team. Um, yeah. A question about if um, a child is registered with an Oxfordshire practice um, but lives in Berkshire or Buckinghamshire, um, does the service cover those patients? Yes, we do. So it's really where the GP practice um, is based. So if the GP practice is within Oxfordshire, but the patient is out of Oxfordshire, we will accept them. Um, but it has to be that way around. So their GP practice has to be within Oxfordshire, but it doesn't matter if the patient, we do have some patients that even are in Aylesbury, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, but their GP is an Oxfordshire GP and that's fine. Um, I just saw the how do we know if if you've reached capacity um, that would be by calling us really our capacity is is such a movable feast because we're covering all aspects of our service um, and we also have you know our complex um, long term children who have escalating needs we have end of life children that we're supporting as a as a wider team as well so there's no quick way to know about capacity only than to give us a call. Yeah, I've put the my I'll put my number on there as well. 
And of yeah. course, if there's not capacity, then and and you think the child needs ongoing input, the referral pathway would be as normal into the um, uh, single referral line to paediatrics, um, for which you can choose to refer either to the Horton or to the John Radcliffe. Yeah, we do. I'm just looking at the other questions quickly. We do cover patients in the south of the county. Um, Lisa, as long as they're, like I said, as long as a GP is within Oxfordshire. Um, Andy. Hi, thanks very much. Hello, nice to meet you all. My name is Andy hey. Valentine. I'm a GP. I also work actually for the ICB with Ed and I'm the CYP uh, LTC clinical lead um, for, for, for Bob. So nice to meet you all. Um, we due to start up, have our first asthma network meeting. Um, uh, later this month and one of the things we're likely to want to develop um, with colleagues across Bob is um, to really better articulate the asthma care pathway um, for, for for children and so obviously there's a bit of overlap with with your pathway here particularly mm. for acute presentations so really just to say hi and I might make contact with you in due course if that's okay just to see where there's sort of overlap but just to be clear, your pathway is only for Oxfordshire. Is there a similar pathway in Bucks or in Berkshire West? That might be a question for, for Ed. No. There isn't. Okay. They don't, yeah, they don't. The no. Bucks and Berkshire West don't have a children's hospital at home service, as far as I'm aware. Okay. So this is just 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 for lucky Oxfordshire. That's that's My good. email in as well. <laughs> um, this did go to um the Bob um prescribing committee um as uh because there were drugs in it and things, so they took an interest. Um and the report there generally was very positive and said really good. And they would they would like to see something like this rolled out in Bucks and Berkshire West. Yeah. Um but um so yeah, it it might be adopted a bit more widely, but um yeah, it depends on their sort of community setup really sure sure okay and um, one final question is just in the situation where you are at capacity do acute peds at the hospital have visibility of your dashboard so that if uh, a gp phones acute pediatrics maybe for some advice you know they're not sure which way to go if actually the patient might have been suitable for the community but you don't have capacity do they know so that the gp doesn't end up just bouncing around trying to find a place for the acutely unwell child to go yeah, so we have our daily um, virtual ward round every day at two o'clock. So we always update the team then of where we're up to with capacity. And as uh, Roy said in his presentation, it's really helpful to know about WE's patients before two o'clock, really, because because they require a visit and we only have two nurses working after five o'clock, it's working out where they are what locality they're in as to you know what whether we can take them or not so we do have a good idea by two what our capacity is and obviously we share that with the team um so yeah but that's that's sort of how how we manage it really on a daily basis i would say sure yeah andy probably to start with when children are you know the more high acuity patients will be coming onto the virtual ward and will be coming under the responsibility of the on-call paediatric consultant for the ambulatory unit. So we will have, you know, really good oversight of that group of patients. And actually, because these patients have the potential to need home visits, we need to be sure about capacity for them. Um, mm. So it may well be that that, you know, for the for the start, as we all get used to the pathway and confident in it, that there will be that discussion happening with on-call paediatrics and us then saying, yes, we think this child is suitable. And then we take on responsibility to liaise with the hospital at home team and escalate the child to our virtual ward. Um, so. OK, so that's not going directly to CCN, that's going really via acute paediatrics well, and the newly Yeah, they need to come and see us, but again, we would have those. So we, we've already had that situation with our with the bronchiolitis pathways. Sometimes we'll get a referral. Sounds like the child doesn't need to come into us in acute um, paediatrics and we will then liaise with the hospital at home team. So it's, you know, it's possible for us to support our colleagues in primary care to facilitate the referral through um, because obviously we recognise time consuming to complete the referral, etc. And actually, if the clinical responsibility is sitting with us, we're happy to facilitate with that. OK, yeah, that's good to know. Thanks. Thanks I very much. Put my email in the chat, Andy, if you 
wanted to get in touch at any point. Great, lovely. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Christina. OK, Sam. Yeah, hi, and thanks for outlining things. Uh, this is something I've been sort of a bit aware of, but not fully aware of. So it's good to understand the detail a bit better. Um, I'm also a GP in um, Oxfordshire, but also work one day a week at the ICB. Um, so I had a couple of small questions and then one sort of more general question, if I may. Um, the number that you gave, you called it a single point of access. Is that accessible through what we know as the single point of access in primary care land, which is sort of the Oxford Health one, or is it a separate one? It's a separate one. So that that is for our children's community nursing service. Yeah. yeah. OK, it, it's just that when you hear about multiple single points of access, it then ceases to become a single point of access. But I understand why you called it that. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And, you know, it is what it is. That's no problem. Um, it and, is for now. It is for now, at least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah OK, thanks. Two, two separate um, points. Yeah. Um, and once it sounds like once the referral is accepted by your team, your team effectively take ownership of of, of things, including because I just wondered if you if they were given safety net in the case example, if they were given safety netting advice, that safety netting advice would be geared around recontacting your team rather than representing to their GP, would it? It would be around recontacting our team, but also um, going via 111 or or representing into the hospital if they needed to. Yeah. OK, I can I can just think that it might be confusing for GPs if they've referred to your service and the safety netting advice includes contact a GP, if you, you know, in extremis yeah. or whatever. Then yes. they might yeah, think, yeah. well, why have they come back to me yeah. in, in that instance? No, so it doesn't sound like that. That's a likely scenario. So that helps to no. know. Um, and you mentioned about prescriptions um, and in the case example you gave, it sounded like the acute um, team recommended the PRED and everything and yeah. then your team took it on from there. So would that be the usual way of things that if prescriptions are required prior to your team being involved, that that dialogue would happen between the GP and say acute peds and then there'd be a plan for prescribing up front. And if if any prescriptions post dated the referral, then it'd be picked up by your team. Yes. So if the the prescriptions would need to be done because within our team, we we do have a nurse prescriber, but not within the hospital at home team. So um, we can't do the prescriptions ourselves. Um, they would need to the patients would sort of almost need to come to us with the prescriptions and then we can yeah. advise on what they're giving. I suppose what I'm getting at is it's not a problem per se for your team to come back and ask for prescribing support from the GP. It's just knowing mm -hmm. what to expect as the referring GP. Mm -hmm. You know, is that sort of a closed case? It's with that team now. I'll hear about them at the point of discharge or is it or they might come back to me for reassessment or they might come back to me for medication, in which case it's just a bit more uncertain. Mm. And I think at the moment, the reality is that they would, if they needed to come back to anybody for a medical review or a prescription, that would be with the acute paediatric team for now. Okay, yeah. but that may evolve, as you say. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, someone else put their hand up. I don't know if that's in, in yeah, response hi, to one of these points. Yeah, it's Roy. Uh, so just to sort of put in perspective from sort of the uh, acute wheeze, it's kind of not really changing what would probably happen in general practice already in terms of if you were initiating salbutamol inhaler or a course of prednisolone. Um, bearing in mind that sort of steroids, if you think they're needed, should, should be given sort of within an hour or so of making the decision. So I guess um, the, the medications that they're going to be used would be prescribed and actually sort of the guidance of use can be initiated by the uh, CCN team and obviously if they're needing excess amounts of salbutamol they're triggering then they're escalated up to us for the next steps in in care if that makes sense. It does yeah but in a way then it might be best practice by referring GPs to provide prescriptions for inhalers and steroids if required perhaps if if they become required later I don't know I'm just thinking or is that then confusing matters? Oh in terms of if you think that they don't need salbutamol at that point or so say I've got someone who is definitely needing salbutamol and may require PRED, but perhaps not right at this minute at the point of referral. Um, and then we'll have input from the CCN team ongoing. And then it becomes clear later in the day that they will need the PRED. If they've already got the prescription to hand, it's probably, I don't, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to confuse things. Just oh, yeah, yeah. I guess really there are, I guess really at that initial assessment they're either going to fit into the category of needing prednisolone or not and I think if they've got to the stage where you're thinking that they are later in the day needing prednisolone these are the ones that are going to be escalated to us in acute paediatrics anyway because they're clearly sort of um, 
uh, sort of flagging a need for a discussion with us. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, but my, I would say, Sam, it is worth thinking about that. I think, you know, the... the Particularly Fridays. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, we want to avoid the use of steroids in the kind of preschool wheezers who we hope will manage without it. But um, in those that you think it might be a possibility and they're going under under the care, it will be easier for the to facilitate for the family if they have a prescription. If that's OK, thank case. you. Um, and then, sorry, the broader question was just about, I think, I, I wonder if one of the reasons for the, the, when I saw the data that you presented, it, it was clear that the utilisation from GPs hadn't increased. And I do wonder whether it's because of the fragmenta fragmentation of hospital at home services in the community. And I didn't know how your service interfaces with the, the service that PML offer, if at all. Um, and so we're the only paediatric service, so our hospital at home is unique in that we it covers the whole of Oxfordshire. The complexity of the service is that the medical cover, so the paediatric medical cover comes from OUH and the nursing care is delivered by Oxford Health. So it's a joint working, but um, the Oxford Health team have access to our ele electronic patient record. We can prescribe and they could administer drugs for patients on our virtual ward. So we are unique in that it's one service. But obviously, our main challenge is geography, as Christine will explain. That's that's a significant challenge for us because we're covering the whole of Oxfordshire. Because I'd say that the in the north of the county, most most access to hospital at home is probably provide like the provider for most of that probably is PML, and therefore it may well be the case that many of the practices in the north and northeast, are, you know, not that I mean it may be that they're not fully aware of the service you're offering, but it might also mm -hmm. be that in thinking that they're going to hospital at home, they may be unsure about whether this is something that's contained within their usual sort of ring up PML and ask for, for help or not. But it helps to understand the difference. And perhaps, you know, as an aspirational thing in future, maybe, who knows, in, in a utopia, maybe they can be aligned. Andy. Yeah, just a very quick thing. Um, Electronic prescribing from the trust would probably help with, you know, making the, you know, care of of kids in the community across the county with lots of rurality and so on easier to manage, particularly where there's a prescribing requirement that comes in unexpectedly late and they don't necessarily need hospital, but maybe they need ipratropium or, you know, I don't know something else. Um, and currently that's really difficult from the hospital if your teams are out in the community and you don't have a prescriber within the community team. Um, so I suppose I've mentioned this, I mention this all the time everywhere I go, because I think it'd be such a great development for, for both primary and secondary care, but any 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 sort of communication you might have within the trust to try and encourage the trust to take on electronic prescribing for secondary care, I think that you can really see a use um, within this particular pathway. Um, Natasha Jones is probably the a good contact or David Wallacher within the trust um, to try and encourage that. Thanks. Thank you, Shaman. You're muted though, Shaman. Sorry, thank you. I, I, can, I was going to come back to Sam's point, but I'll come back to Andy's point is that in, certainly in the adult services, um, I think the for the outset of the CERNA team are trying to look at a electronic prescribing solution. There is obviously EMIS that we use in the um, community directorate where we can do electronic prescriptions and that is being worked up. So, um, but let's the bit of an age old sort of discussion about, you know, EMIS versus CERNA, which is a, a, a tricky point in within the adult services so yeah absolutely and um, but i think certainly the adult hospital at home team are looking into that so uh, you know on cerna so that would just be applicable i imagine to to, to zoe and her, her team to, to do the same via that and um, just going back to sam's point in terms of gp uptake in terms of referral into hospital home, i wasn't sure and it is maybe multifactorial but in terms of you know, for the adult patients, we're very used to using hospital at home and have confidence and experience of, and, and know those patients will be, you know, safe and well looked after. And I'm sure they would be in paediatrics, but I guess it's just the two GPs out there feel, you know, it's it's children at the end of the day and, and, and whether they, they feel that they are 
similarly you know looked after and supported in also and it's just whether that is some of the issue whether the sort of understanding and geography um might play into that and ed i don't i don't know what work has been done on that in terms of you know ongoing education for primary care that hospital at home you know for children this is what they can do and this the, this is the kind of stuff that they're absolutely able to to manage and cope with in the community um, and reducing some of that anxiety perhaps amongst GPs that these patients won't be in hospital but will be managed in their own homes by those by that community nursing team. So yeah we're, we're trying to spread the word we'd love to get get it more out there and and widely known and um, you know we put stuff in the bulletin um, we held a webinar last year we've got webinar this uh, now as well so I think you know just tell your colleagues I think if you're um, you know in practice or coming across patients and you think well how am I going to manage this I think you know let's let's just get this known and you're right it's a lot of it's going to be a bit of word of mouth and experience you know mm. I had a good experience of using this service and this is what happened this is what the patient came back to me about and things and then and, and just trying to do that so um, yeah we we're trying. I've, yeah, I've tried as many sort of different routes as I, we can think of, but I, th I think word of mouth would also be, you know, quite useful as well. Um, I'm aware we're slightly over time, aren't we? And I've got a couple mm. more hands up. So, Sarah, would you like to come in? Yeah, um, it just occurred to me, do you accept referrals from, um, say, ANPs? Because increasingly, ANPs would be seeing a lot of acute illness in general practice. We have a couple of very experienced ANPs, one of whom's, you know, our respiratory lead. So, it would be great if she could refer indirectly, that was all. Um, I must admit, we hadn't, uh, you know, we hadn't, that's not something that we had um, sort of thought about with regards to, um, but I think somebody who has appropriate diagnostic um, assessment skills would be appropriate. I would feel um, we don't take referrals directly from ambulance service, although, um, uh, 999 ambulances are able to refer into our paediatric pathway directly and we wouldn't we don't currently accept referrals from 111 or from SCAS into our hospital at home um, so yes those with appropriate assessment skills there, there's no reason that those couldn't be referred. Thank you thanks. I think that case study actually did come oh no maybe it was another one later on this week came from a paramedic in a GP setting who had liaised with the acute peds team and we could take them no problem um <clears throat> and I just saw uh Lisa's comment about she's a bit nervous that if we we get to capacity very quickly if everyone got to know about it but I think you know it, it is it, uh, the Children's Hospital at Home service is a possibility for children in Oxfordshire and if we're busting at the seams then we review that within our Opal levels as well and look at what we've got coming in. So yeah, please don't let that stop you, I would say. Thank Sam. you. Sam? Yeah, no, I know that um, our paramedic is referred to it, which is how I knew about the service and also I guess the traffic light system facilitates uh, sort of agnostic to you know the individual clinician as long as they, they made a suitable assessment and are working via those guidelines it would seem to make sense um yeah it was about um sort of spreading the word really so i i don't want i'm i'm a pc and clinical director myself i know andy is as well and i think um sarah is too but i don't want to we receive lots of information about lots of things so i don't want to sort of risk further overburdening us but there is a, a bi-monthly um meeting of PCM clinical directors next week could easily given that this is recorded we could uh, as a minimum you know name drop it and say that there's a recorded webinar if people are interested that might help um, and also we've got the um, Bob ICB um, PLT uh, protected learning time for practices next Thursday I mean I, I don't know whether you want I don't think it's realistic to do this all over again next week but um, it might be that a, a small you know you could you could find a time to mention it because I think the ICB has sort of centralised communications for the Oxfordshire practices for a chunk of the afternoon, not a long time, but you could add it to that if you wanted. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I think going out through the PCN CDs um, would, would be useful and I'll get in touch with Michelle then and see if she can just um, name name check it and, and, the, and the webinar and the recording at the outset of the um, of the PLT. That'd be useful. Thank you. Andy. Sorry, I know it's short of time. It'll all come to life in the latter half of your, <laughs> of your meeting. I think um, 
it, I mean, it's a really great service. And I think if people got used to using it, you probably will be swamped with numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of the admission avoidance figures you presented and the saving half a million, you know, within a year, and that's only with the capacity to see 12 or maybe 16 kids at any one time, you can kind of see how it makes sense probably financially um, to do so as well, as long as you can get the staff, of course. Mm -hmm. And we're heading heading into winter and you could sort of see how this is quite a seasonal service probably as well. So mm -hmm. you can sort of, I don't know, maybe pull staff out of the hospital perhaps during winter months and then and then bring them back in. I don't know. I don't know how, how, how you would staff it. That's for you guys to uh, understand, I suppose. But where you where you receive a referral but don't have capacity to see that child because you're 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 fully at capacity in the community it might be worth thinking about how to how to um capture that data in a way yeah. of then being able to say these are the number of kids we could have yes. helped if only we had the resource to be able to do so in the community because it, it you know assuming it's a an effective and safe service which i'm sure it is then it's a bit of a win for everybody. It's much nicer for parents and for kids to be able to stay at home and be looked Absolutely. after there uh, yeah. as well. Um, it's just a case of, you know, matching resource and demand really, isn't it? I think. Yeah. So we have already started to capture the patients that we're rejecting because we're at capacity. And I just answered your question, Andy, in the chat about, you know, how often over the past month have we been at capacity or, you know, how oh, often you. do you get... In, in October, we, we were at capacity really quite a lot, but because it's a quick turnover of patients, so we'll often, you know, in the morning come in and we know that probably we're going to discharge five children. So we sort of then balance, can we take five more? Um, so although we have been over capacity, the amount of children that we've re rejected has been actually really quite low. Um, so we have been able to sort of take them and we've just recently really reviewed all of our OPAL levels in terms of how the wider CCN service is working and where we need to prioritise. Um, so, yes, the re the patients that we've rejected have been have been low, but I think that that might well increase as we really head into the thick of the winter. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. I think that was yeah, really useful discussion. Everyone came to life in the last 25 minutes or so there with the, with the questions and things, but really, um, really useful. So um, thank you. I can't see any other comments or anything we haven't answered in the chats, but um, yes, I think it's a bit now about spreading the words um, and, and making making use of, of the service and, um, and making use of the uh, Healthier Together website and the app as well. So, um, you know, please do look at that. Please do share it with patients and families and um, do consider signing up as practices as well. I think that'd be really, um, really helpful. And yeah, as Kaylee said, you can get in touch with Kaylee. Any last comments from the team from anyone? No? All right. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.